Welcome to today's webinar, Eavesdropping on the Experts, Exploring the Future of Clinical Research for Inflammatory Disorders. My name, my name is Liz Schickling, and I am a Marketing Manager here at Worldwide Clinical Trials. Before we kick things off, I'd like to go over a few things. All attendees are on mute, but please use the questions window to submit questions at any time pertaining to the presentation, as we will be reserving time for a Q&A session at the end. This webinar is being recorded, and all attendees will receive an email with a link to access the on-demand recording. I'd like to introduce our six experts who we will be hearing from today. Michael Murphy, Chief Medical and Scientific Officer. Uh, Ingrid Van Rompe, Director of Project Management. William Sloan, Fellow, Clinical Research Methodology. Ateri Tetzladzi. Senior Medical Director of Medical and Scientific Affairs. Rolana Avramson, Associate Director of Clinical Proje Projects, Clinical Assessment Technologies. And Jim Khalifa, Executive Director of Medical and Scientific Affairs. We'd like to start by inviting you to participate in a quick poll. And I'm going to open up the line to Dr. Murphy to elaborate a little more on the question. Well, good morning, good afternoon, everyone. We continue with a series at WCT focusing on therapeutic areas and phase of research. Today, of course, is about immune-mediated inflammatory disorders. The meeting has an objective of sharing content, but even more importantly, to share with you a method of doing business, a process. So before we begin, we wanted to get a calibration of the audience in terms of the following question. As you look at your company regarding therapeutic innovation and broadly defined area of immune-mediated inflammatory disorders, would you say that, that your company is actively engaged in what I would call a transformational effort? You're reevaluating the method of doing business in IMID? Or in, in contrast, are you still kind of risk aversive, which of course is quite understandable? and following very traditional pathways for product development and registration uh, is neither applicable or some of you on the phone may actually not be in, involved very much in IMID type research and of course we want to see that as well. So if you can take a moment please just pick one of these and we'll see what the results look like. Ah, interesting. So about half of you are actually rethinking the way that you do business. That's very similar to what's going on in our company as well, as you'll see in a minute. So it is indeed an exciting time. And it occurs to me that there's so many challenges in terms of developing a, a clinical development program. So, I mean, so what we're going to do, team, is kind of walk through a, a series of questions. The first one would be, where do you actually start? I mean, this is a neat looking graphic that we've put together. I guess it does reveal the complexity of what we need to do. So, so Will, I'm not talking this one to you. So a, a clinical development program can extend, as we know, from translational research activities that frankly begin even prior to IND enabling work, all the way through marketing commercialization. Pretty ambitious. In fact, isn't it overly ambitious to think in this fashion we don't really know product attributes? How would you actually design a program where there's very little precedent? I mean, so where do you actually start? <laughs> well, it's, it's a funny question you ask there, Dr. Murphy, because you know you're always sending me these projects and you're always saying, well, well, this is easy. You know, you got this. This is, this is so easy. We got this. Uh, of course, I know you're, you're, you're being flippant and making a joke of it, but because really these, especially in the immune-mediated disorders, you know, the, the products that the sponsors are coming out with and, okay. and the, the science behind it is really so elegant and, and so specific. So really for me, when I start to try to develop these, create these clinical development programs, I like to start from what I say like a 50,000-foot view and then try to bring it down to a microscopic level. And I, I really like the background infographic that we've got here on the, on the slide it, because that's really what I try to do when I'm starting to create these is I try to create a nest or an outline, kind of a database, uh, where I start by, you know, the 50,000 foot view. So getting to know the indication, getting to know the sponsor, 
So you know, it involves doing you know, web searches, looking at press releases, seeing what's out there, what, what's hot in the field, um, looking at the sponsor's website, seeing, trying to get a feel for what their goals are, or what you know, what other products they may have in their pipeline, you know, kind of where it's at strategically. Um, and then importantly, also, we always try to look at the at the competitive space. You know, look at look at the competitors' websites, see what the precedent is out there. You know, or is there a competitive product that's been working with the FDA that's going to give us precedent as we create these programs? Um, then I kind of try to niche it down a little bit more. You know, try to evaluate the field, get a feel for the for the regulatory environment, uh, which involves you know doing literature searches, um, looking at guidance documents, and that's really where I uh, try to fall back on my I come from more of a uh, basic research background, so you know, really kind of try to dig down, drill down, get an understanding of the science, uh, and that really helps us start to create these programs that are, are very specific. Um, another important part is we also try to look at you know what's going on with working groups with the advocacy organizations. It's becoming more and more important um, to get you know uh, patient reported outcomes in there. You know, just is not only is this product hitting clinical endpoints, but is it making the patients feel better? And so we got to try to work that into the clinical development program for the drug to ultimately be successful and, you know, help the patients. Um, so that kind of generates a kind of an outline of information. You know, you got this scattered board here on the on the background, this scattered chalkboard. Um, so it does give some answers, you know, we start putting together the plan, but really it, it ultimately creates more questions. Uh, so that's in where I really we really start trying to niche it down as a team. And um, one of the things I really like about working with Worldwide, I'm, I'm pretty fairly new here, like I said, just from a uh, basic research type background is that we've got both content experts that are on the basic side of research where I came from and then we've also got a lot of medical experts out there and I can go to them and ask them questions you know try to see if they have some answers on, on maybe the medical side and and the great thing that I found so far is that if they don't know the answers then they likely know somebody who who does so that's where we start reaching out to, to KOLs you know our contacts in the field uh, and really that back and forth kind of helps us, you know, engage and start to put together a, a really good program. Uh, another thing that I really like is that we try to do is, is a lot of back and forth with the sponsor, you know, ask them what their goals are, you know, what the, what are their ideas, and you say, here's what we've seen in the literature, here's what our KOLs are saying, what do you think about this, how should we, you know, incorporate this into your clinical development plan. Um, after that, you know, it's it's kind of putting pen to paper, we start organizing this, writing it out, um, and then it's, you know, kind of a, a write and revise, a, a back and forth with the sponsors, with the KOLs, you know, keeping current with the literature as we as we develop this. Uh, I was joking with one of my, my old colleagues that I had back, I said, you know, I have I often have flashbacks to my dissertation when we're, we're putting these together, you know, it's so specific, so niche down, um, trying to get everything incorporated in there, bring in the right people. Um, but at the end of the day, I think, you know, it really puts together a, a strong proposal where we can, you know, get all the measures and all the things in there that we need. And so that's kind of how we how we try to approach it when we're, we're putting together these programs. Sounds like so, process is um, as important as content. And oh, yeah. It, it, yeah, it seems to me, Will, that this is going to be pretty specific to the individual indication, certainly the type of technology and absolutely to the sponsor. Yeah, you know that th there's a lot of truth to that, and it's it's you know for each individual you know each individual indication each sponsor has the, the you know these unique aspects, but really at the, at the end of the day it's as you kind of alluded to there it, it's about the process you know we can take this it, it's all about you know doing the research, getting a grasp of the science you know addre addressing the people that are in the basic research side of it getting an understanding of the mechanisms how how this product's likely going to work how it's going to infect. And then also looking at the disease side, you know, talking to the patients, talking to the KOLs, talking to our content experts on the medical side, um, engaging the experts. And, and like I said, it, it's really creating this dialogue back and forth between us, the sponsors, and the KOLs, and even the patients and advocacy groups, um, you know, being good colleagues. Um, so then, you know, organizing that all into, you know, a, a structure. So the process of, of organizing it into that structure is how, we, you know, we get to create these programs. Jim, I hear a lot of medical oversight in this type of activity. How do you see it? We were talking about KOL involvement, and I know Jim has had a great deal of activity in that regard. Rolana, I hear, also hear specialized measures in here. 
Yes, definitely, and I was actually curious, Will, because you, you mentioned patient reported outcomes, you measure, you, you mentioned the measures, so of course my interest is peaked, right, because you're, you're touching on, on my area, and, and I'm curious, when you're talking about um, your different approaches to, to research design and, and the different um, methods you go about you making these decisions regarding these designs. As far as the assessments go, the PROs, how do you go about um, finding the right assessments for a specific study and um, you know how, how do you how do you make your recommendations to the sponsors? Well, obviously one is a lot of back and forth with you and a lot of discussions but also we, we really tr try to you know dig down into you know is there anything regulatory precedent uh, a lot of these come from a lot of especially when we get into you know rare diseases the you know the advocacy groups have have a lot of you know influence and they, they have a lot of ideas and so it's, it's it's kind of combining what's going on with the patients the caregivers with what's on the regulatory side um, and then just just back and forth you know can they be validated all the all the you know intricacies that you know go into it and, and again it's that back and forth with with people trying to organize people that have thoughts on these uh, ideas yeah it's yeah. it's it's great to hear the patient advocacy group part I mean it, it's patients are just so key and vital to the success of a, a trial but also the information that you're going to get from them is is just so important and tells you so much about the the treatment itself the the medication itself so it's it's good to hear that they're um, involved as well when you're when you're thinking about uh, design and, and incorporating these assessments uh, you know Rolana the uh, I, I declare victory if we can even get the primary right much less all the supportive <laughs> you know some of these things that people are working on now in the immune space are just so layered and multifaceted with so many different dimensions that need to be considered it's very difficult yeah to actually choose the measure, you know, in a, in a correct way. And um, I, I think that's been our experience and increasingly our experience. Everyone's moving away from codified protocols is the way I would say it and into more specialty type studies. In fact, Will, I, I'm thinking if something comes up with me is sometimes you can be too clever. I call it too clever by half. You know, we like innovative experimental designs. They're occasionally very efficient and informative. But you know, but you know, what are the issues that you need to think about before you would recommend that? And you know, and I also imagine there's a lot larger team involved when you start to get into complex designs. How do you see that? Oh yeah, absolutely. I mean, I can think of a few examples. You know, we just we just had a study we're working with sponsors and and trying to incorporate um, you know an adaptive design which required biomarkers. And you know, one of the issues was, well, will this biomarker it, one it can not even be clinically adapted, and will it fit into the timeline? And so that involved, you know, reaching out to our early phase team in, in San Antonio and asking them, say, do you guys have any information on this? Do you have you heard of this biomarker? Do you know is there a way we can assay it? Um, and it really led to a really, you know, a couple weeks just back and forth with them and ideas, you know, they came up with an idea for, for a large array type assay where, you know, you're going to do look at all these different biomarkers, but really we only needed that one or two for the study. And so Rich reached out to some of the, our contacts, you know, vendors and, just, you know, kind of gave them a flavor for what the problem was. And we went from potentially doing this big array just because of the back and forth we had, you know, that was going to cost thousands of dollars and may have been even limiting because of the cost. We got it down and found that, you know, it could have been done with with a simple PCR assay, less than 50 bucks a patient, and so it really, then it fit in, made it fit into the timeline, it made it fit into the budget, and it was just, you know, it, again, it's that back and forth that we have that's really been helpful. Well, it seems to me I've heard three or four different themes on this topic. So I, I see, like, innovating and innovative science meeting refined patient phenotypes, kind of the intersection of clever technology and the need to be very specific with the types of patients. Certainly there's a need to understand the disease and the way it appears to me, you know, we can all read the literature, but you know, appreciating the illness is really different. And bringing in the physicians and caregivers that see these patients and manage the issues is indispensable when you try to put together a clinical development program. 
And I continue to go back to this feeling, listening to you and others talk about this periodically. There's an old expression, that great process trumps brilliant planning. How you do it and the method by which you engage in the process is every bit of as, as important, some, and usually much more important than how you would plan to do it. So, I mean, really a terrific discussion. Now, this brings into mind a really important topic is, you know, how do we do these measures? I mean, Rolana was mentioning patient reported outcomes. So, so Rolana, I was just wondering that, you know, as Will has mentioned, this appears to be an emerging demand across therapeutic areas and especially in immunological indications. I mean, yes, we can we can look at target engagement and that's really key, but everyone wants to know how does a patient you know, feel, function, and so forth. How do you approach the selection of those measures? What kind of parameters do you usually think about? And you know, what are the real practical versus the theoretical considerations? Because you need to live in both of those worlds. Definitely, and these are these are great questions. Before I talk about the the you know those those practical operational considerations, uh, I, I want to drive home why PROs are so important. And you know, it's uh, traditionally we've had outcome measures are typically more um, you know they're they're what we call clin rows, right? Clinic rated clinician rated outcome measures and now we're we're moving more towards an emphasis on these patient reported outcomes and the reason for that is because patients are becoming they're highly regarded um, as key stakeholder or key stakeholders rather in in medicine they're you know along with with the physicians out there regulate regulators payers uh, patients are seen as influencers. They can influence access to medication, to treatments, and also they can influence um, decisions about reimbursement. So because of this, PROs are becoming more prevalent in research across indications and um, you know, especially in immunological indications. They're a way to quantify qualitative information. So you, know, you mentioned, Dr. Murphy, the, the idea of how does the patient feel? You know, and they can tell you how how do they feel? Are they are they hurting? Are they are they feeling frustrated? Are they not able to engage in certain activities? But now we have a way to really quantify that and to provide very rich data and input into um, into the the effectiveness of a, of a treatment. So when we're thinking about um, selecting the PROs, there are a number of things to think about. But the first and foremost, you need to think about what do you want to measure, right? So I think in general when people think about PROs, they think quality of life measures, which is absolutely correct and key, and I will talk about quality of life measures in, in just a bit. But PROs can also um, include um, information about symptom severity, um, you know, just even a patient's pain level, for instance, right? They're they're using the a numeric rating scale, numeric pain rating scale. That's that's a PRO right there. Um, they they uh, they assess functioning and ADLs. So um, you know, in terms of their their activities, basic hygiene. Um, are they able to actually get dressed? Are they able to to take care of themselves? And if not, you know, can they to to some degree? Their health status, quality of life. Um, healthcare utilization, as well as patient satisfaction. So patient satisfaction is actually very interesting because um, it differs from quality of life measures and it differs from other outcome measures because it's actually addressing the process of treatment rather than the outcome. So you're actually getting a lot of information about um, the accept uh, acceptability of the drug, um, and also the quality of care that the patients are receiving. And again, that's going to drive some decision making um, by, by physicians and, and, and regulators. So what we're seeing now is a lot of studies, are they're, they're using these patient satisfaction questionnaires as well. And when you're thinking about quality of life measures, which is, I think, the probably one of the most common PROs that are being used in, in these trials, um, you have to think about, well, what are you, again, going back to what are you measuring, right? There are a lot of generic quality of life measures or 
health-related quality of life measures out there. They'll, they'll ask um, a lot of questions across several domains. They'll provide, you know, uh, scores, but, um, you know, they're not specific to the disease itself. And so there's, there's traditionally been some value placed on these generic quality of life measures because the thought was, well, you can compare across indications. But the problem is that when you're using quality of life measures that aren't disease specific, you're going to miss some key um, information. There, are Some of these questions, because they're general, they may not be relevant to the, the patient population or the indication under study versus, um, you know, specific quality of life measures like QLQ30 for, for MS, for instance, um, just as an example, you know, they'll, they'll have, they'll address specific issues that the patients will be experiencing, um, you know, as it relates to their disease. So what happens is that um, you get a lot of rich information there, and then these outcomes, or these spe disease specific outcomes can also show differences between competing treatments. So once you decide what kind of measure uh, you want to use, what you're wanting to measure, then you have to think about, okay, well, how are they developed? Have these scales been validated? And thinking about cultural considerations and linguistic considerations. So have your PROs been, chosen PROs been translated? Um, have they been culturally validated for, for, these po for the populations under study? And even if you have a study that's US-based, um, you know, we also need to consider U.S. Spanish. So think about the, the patients who are likely to come into your study. Would these uh, PROs be appropriate for them? If they have been validated, look into the research. What methods of techniques uh, or techniques were employed to validate these, these scales, both as, as a measure itself, but, but also um, culturally and, and linguistically. Um, and, you know, Will mentioned before doing literature review and, and looking at all these um, and talking to key groups and, and um, you know, all these different methods to when, when you're putting together a, a design, I, I would say don't solely rely on those databases, um, you know, to, to come up with the, the PROs because you'll have a list of different PROs, but they may not be validated. So I would say go a step further, review the literature for each scale, look at any validation information, and use scale experts for protocol input. Will said, well, there's a lot of discussion between myself and him, my group with him, and that's absolutely true. You know, um, we're lucky to be in a CRO that, that has these um, experts in-house, but in general, talk to KOLs, talk to the people who are familiar with these measures and this disease to so they can give good protocol input. I tell you, um, Ingrid, I'm hearing lots of side burden here from your point of view. You're responsible for clinical operations. What has been your involvement in, in the selection of these assessments? Yeah, well, usually, indeed, uh, you know, the, when the protocol is written, uh, all those QLs have given uh, their their uh, input, and uh, it is uh, usually then, uh, when it comes to me, usually it's uh, already been decided which uh, type of questionnaire they would be using. But then we are indeed in the challenge that we also need to find the patients, uh, and sometimes you do go to some exotic places where you have very exotic languages, and uh, that is something that you really very carefully need to check as, as, um, uh, as Rolana was saying, you know, you need to have validated translation. It's not just a matter of having a translation. It is a matter that that translation in that language and in that culture needs to make sense and uh, needs to bring you what you will be measuring. And that is really sometimes a challenge. Uh, recently in, in, uh, in a, um, in a, a program I was uh, I was managing, um, we had the challenge that actually there was no validated translation uh, for three languages out of the 45 we were uh, looking at, um, and uh, it was it was frustrating because we had to do the all validation process uh, before we were able to use the uh, those uh, three particular languages. 
um, and of course uh, it's uh, always uh, um, where you have the highest uh, patient potential that you yeah. that you lose that time so uh, that's a very it's it's really a very very important uh, aspect um, of the study and in in uh, in immune disease immune mediated diseases uh, these questionnaires are really really key um, because it's the disease themselves are very often extremely complex and as Rolana was also very uh, you know rightfully pointing um, you know you can't use uh, the very classical uh, ones uh, in terms of quality of life because indeed they are a disease com a component uh, to uh, how the patient is feeling that you also need to capture and that has extremely specific to uh, to a particular indications mm -hmm. you know there are one... sorry i was i, I wanted to <laughs> i wanted to, to jump in and and also note you know for for situations where the um you know the the pro is not available in that particular language you know like like ingrid said you know there are some very exotic languages or some you know um uncommon languages um, that we may need to consider, I would say, you know, don't get discouraged and don't discount those those patients or that geographical area because even if a PRO has not been validated um, for a particular language by the copyright holder or by another vendor, certainly there are ways to do that um, during startup. Uh, it's just something to to think about when you're when you're putting together your your timelines. So if we need to go to a translations vendor, for instance, to translate and validate a, a scale, you, I mean typically it's about twelve weeks or so, give or take. I you know different for every vendor, but it's something to consider when you're when you're developing the timelines for a study. But again, you don't need to discount a, a you know a, a population because you can't find that scale in that particular language. Oh, you know, no, one, final, uh, uh, one final question for Jim on this one. Jim, I mean, you're very much in touch with the physicians that, that are doing these trials. Uh, do they put a lot of emphasis on these types of measures other than the primary? You know, other than yeah. the primary. How, how do you see that? It's, it's uh, you know, it's very important nowadays, specifically the patient's uh, input, because now, you know, we know we have very much patient diaries in mostly all trials and you know now it became very well developed electronically that patients can very much use them like a cell phone and it's validated and they can report on a very much 24-7 their impression about the, 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 the disease about the, the drug they're using in the study and that's really important you know and the outcome of the trials because they give you a huge amount of data that's needed in addition to that, also now we have, for example, specifically for the IMEDs, you have the, the, the depression scale is required for the Columbia suicide scale because that's part of the profile for the disease. So now it's required for most of these biologics, you know, to have to record that. So these type of scales are very important now to satisfy the requirement for the data and then also the regula regulatory you know, requirement for that. So yes, definitely now it became very, very important to consider and to make sure that they have the right scale, uh, and the right tool to record it and to collect the data. Well, it seems to me I've heard three or four different points here that need to be collapsed. So it's even early phase research is much more than simply demonstrating target engagement, as important as that is. We need to look at other dimensions of the illness. I hear a very strong sentiment in here from Ingrid and, and Rolana and yourself there uh, about standing with the site, looking at it from the site's perspective, at the same time speaking for the patient, looking at it from the patient's point of view. And one thing that's loud and clear is that the assessments are entwined with, frankly, everything else that we do. Every little addition or deletion that we make affects multiple functional areas within our company. So once again, we come back to the issue of good process, integrating that with the overall discussion. Now, it, you know, making this all happen, of course, is the difficulty in balancing the needs of all of these conflicting consideration seems to be such an important issue and, and frankly a very difficult one. So Ingrid, I was thinking, you know, there seem to be demands for trial sensitivity. You know, you have to get signal detection, but at the same time, 
there has to be very brisk program execution, many indications, it's, all, it's always this way it seems, but especially in immune-mediated disorder. So how do, you, how do you balance the need for study integrity and signal detection against the need for prompt program startup and completion? What's the magic here, Ingrid? Well, the magic is that uh, lies, of course, in project management. <laughs> so I'm selling my my uh, my shop here. Um, yeah, well, you you really have to be creative uh, because on one hand you want really uh, your your program to be uh, to be successful, of course, of course, and so you first need to find the patients. On the other hand, you need to understand very well what the sponsors' needs are as well, because indeed, you know, and especially in those in the disease where we are working, in immune mediated disease are very often rare diseases. Um, you, of course, they, they are. These investments are really huge, um, and uh, they are depending on uh, being able to have their funds. Uh, so communication is also important, and they might have, uh, you know, specific time points that they need to either uh, release to their stakeholders, um, or uh, indeed being able to make those uh, very early on uh, decisions. Um, and being careful at the same time, not killing, I would say, uh, the drug before it has a chance to demonstrate something. So you need to really take all this into account and, and very often you need to be very uh, inventive, I would say, and out of the box thinking, sometimes working, uh, I would say, around very established uh, habits uh, in terms of startup. So very recently uh, in a program for a rare disease that we were developing, we had extremely tight uh, timelines. Um, uh, we had we had to, to deliver a certain amount of data by a certain date because the company absolutely needed uh, to make a communication in order to get uh, the next funds uh, to uh, continue the program. Uh, so um, and, and it was really crazy timelines. So what we did there uh, was really uh, well. First, of course, uh, come up very quickly with a with a site selection, with a country selection, um, and that was done really through a doctor to doctor phone call. So our medical monitor called directly uh, the the sites that we were targeting, speaking about the study. We had. Um, uh, in the meantime, we were still like finishing uh, the, the, uh, the, the the study protocol. Um, uh, we we had these very very interactive uh, discussions, and that uh, you know ended up, I would say, with the first selection uh, for sites and countries. And then we immediately started all the submission process while we were still validating. Uh, the participation of the sites because there were other practical aspects that we had uh, to uh, to check that disease was also a very particular disease that could eventually be um, I would say diagnosed well the diagnosis of that particular disease was was particular so we wanted to make sure that the 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 way the the sites were diagnosing the the patients uh, were um, uh, were consistent with what we would expect for the protocol. So while we were submitting all, uh, you know, we were ongoing with the submission process and the contractual process, um, we uh, had again our medical monitor and the medical monitor of the sponsor going to the sites and rediscussing with the PI, checking with the, uh, the patient's file really uh, whether, uh, you know, we were right in our site selection or not. So these type of you know, fast tracking. Uh, uh, this is what we did to achieve those uh, those very tight timeline. Also, in terms of um, of, uh, of resourcing, typically you would you know do calculate your resourcing based on the volume of uh, work done. But of course, and I think many of us know the triangle um, of the project management. If you need to constrain uh, the time you need to increase your resources uh, and have this, uh, I would say, um, uh, back workforce uh, behind you um, to be able to uh, multitask, I would say, on the, w without jeopardizing uh, the quality, of course, of your, uh, of your, uh, of your work. So Ingrid, so, here's, a, here's a question for you that I have, though. I mean, it seems to me some of the protocols we have 
are increasingly complex, and you encounter sites that have patients and they have good clinical skills and they seem otherwise adequate in every way, but they're not experienced enough, frankly, to run the study. Do, do you walk away from them? Do you bring them up to speed? What, what's your strategy with that? Uh, we thought if they have the patients, especially in rare diseases, we would certainly not walk away. We would, uh, you know, increase our CRA task force. We would increase um, the the medical support. Uh, we would uh, provide additional uh, training to the sites. We would certainly, for the first patients, uh, really work hand in hand. Um, and if uh, you know, sometimes not possible to be at the site uh, to really check and have that uh, live discussion with the investigators. Uh, we would uh, set up uh, either by uh, teleconferences. Uh, you know, I have very often now teleconferences directly with a particular site, uh, with the medical monitor, with the PI, with the study coordinator, and we go over the cases. Um, uh, and um, the CRA here is really key. You really have to have a very well-trained CRAs that uh, are really understanding uh, what we need from the sites and where the challenges might be. So there, again, the medical monitor uh, expertise is, is key there as well. And not only ours, but also the sponsors, because the sponsor, they are developing very often their uh, product in a disease that they already probably may know. So it's, it's important to really be uh, uh, good partners in there. But we should certainly do not walk away from sites that might have patients. I heard you use an interesting expression that you surround our CRAs with experts. Mm -hmm. Giving them the support to manage the site in a more effective way. That, that is key, yes. And Roland, I, I hear a special role for you to bring the site up to speed and some of these specialized measures that you alluded to. Do you have any suggestions in that regard? Oh, absolutely. I, I mean, really, training is key. Um, regard whether the the assessments are clinic clinician rated or if they're patient rated rated it is absolutely key so what really you should think about is building in some rater training program um, during your startup process so you have the the raters uh, trained on the scales themselves or any specific if there's a uh, interviewing uh, nuances to interviewing the patient or specific nuances to to consider with regard to the disease what well, you know assessing certain symptoms of the disease certainly getting the, them trained is is absolutely important and it's the same thing with the the PROs actually even though they're not the ones filling out these assessments they essentially become the the, the trainer for the the patients so they should be up to speed on these PROs and be able to um, to train these the the patients to to rate consistently and to understand the the questions that are being asked of them. Um, so as long as the training is is incorporated during startup, you do this during um, an IM, and there are ways to do it post IM as well virtually. Um, you can you can get these these sites up to speed and and ready to to assess. I think I've heard three or four key points in this discussion. So. One is fewer sites, but better sites. I'm hearing, and we're hearing this across therapeutic areas, every sponsor is having this discussion. It's not a rush to a finish line with patient numbers. It's the, it's, it, it is a need to execute milestones and timelines, of course, but signal sensitivity and assay sensitivity is key. So it's kind of like fewer better sites seems to emerge from our discussion. I also hear from Ingrid this this issue of preemption, preemption remediation, anticipating the problems before they occur, uh, and a great project manager, as we know, Ingrid always does that, and in, intervening for this actually an issue to attend. And I also love the idea. I call it the magic of managing, the magic of managing the sponsors and the sites. You're really managing a system. It's a system. We call it a protocol, but in effect. There are multiple different stakeholders in that protocol. And your role, particularly Ingrid, in clinical operations is to manage that effectively. Such a challenging issue. Now, now this brings into mind the whole issue that we're at globalization. Boy, has that taken off. In the last few years, it's been so exceptional. And I was wondering, Terry, from your particular perspective, you know, what has been the benefit of performing 
IMID clinical trials, and, and let's say non-traditional countries, countries that don't routinely participate in GCP type studies, you know, I mean, do you think it's an opportunity or do you receive data that has an acceptable level of validity or or do you find from your experience, because you have so much in Eastern and Central Europe particularly, do, do, do you find the process of trying to do that and then presenting the data creating an unacceptable challenge? So what's been your experience to date? Thank you very much for your question, Mike. So I think that while conducting trials in uh, immune-mediated inflammatory disease, it is unavoidable to go to the non-traditional countries because mostly we are tested the biologics or strong immunosuppressive drugs and we mostly need the treatment naive patients. And those countries can provide the good resource for treatment naive patients. And mostly we have to go to these non-traditional countries to conduct a trial. And we all understand that there are a lot of challenges, but understanding the challenges, we can manage it and we can receive the data which are completely acceptable for us and as for sponsor as well. So re the reason why we have challenges in non-traditional countries is that the treatment uh, uh, standard of care in dif different regions are completely different. And the study population is different as well. Because in non-traditional countries, the patients may have uh, uh, poor access to the medical treatment or they may not be treated regularly by the medications which are indicated to treat this particular disease. And finally, they are switched to directly from newly available uh, investigational drug without being treated with the already available drugs on, on the market which are indicated to, the, to treat this particular disease. Also, there might be an issue with a population who may have some underdiagnosed illnesses at screening because, again, because of lack of insurance or lack of access to the medical care. And this might be serious problem when the patients go to the trial, they may have some problems while providing strong immunosuppressive therapy or biologic treatment. And this is important to understand. So Terry, uh, doesn't that mean it, Terry, that the, if the standards of care are so varied, and I had this discussion yesterday in rheumatoid arthritis with the KOL, it, does that make the ability to interpret the data more difficult? I understand your question and your point, Mike. So when physician sees the study results and when uh, investigator use or a physician use the study result in daily practice, they look to the data and they are not interpreting the results based on the regional, regional, regional difference. And that is why this is time to go to the standard design protocol to adaptive uh, study design just to address the um, needs for different populations and different regions. Even uh, with these challenges, as Ingrid mentioned, we had a lot of trials with very tight timelines in different regions with the investigators who uh, talk in different languages and do have definitely do have different standard of care, a strong relationship with the sites and physician to physician communication, which is needed not only at investigators meeting or after investigators meeting, but since the beginning when they start up, within the startup process, when we are going to uh, have the site or investigator on board, Physician to physician invest, uh, communication is a key because we can talk about the aim of the study, about the challenges of the study, and we can address all potential signals 
or some problems which might be related to the daily practice of the investigators and address them properly and timely. So even this is related to significant challenge. I think this is unavoidable, this is manageable if we have a strong team locally, if we have a dedicated team, knowledgeable team, uh, motivated investigators and very good communications, I mean physician to physician communication with the sites. Ingrid, what's been your experience operationally with countries that really don't have a pedigree for doing GCP studies? What, what, how has that worked for you? The only way you can really make it work is to increase your CRA force because you will need to be very, very often at the site uh, for those uh, for those uh, particular sites because you will be you you will need to train them. But you know that always makes me think when I started uh, uh, the clinical studies as a CRA, it was uh, before the addition of the GCPs, but we were already following the GCPs. Nobody was trained in GCPs, so as a CRA, I was actually. Uh, responsible to to train uh, the sites for a GCP. This is this was done, I would say, not only in the exotic countries, but in our countries as well. In, in here, uh, well, my country is Belgium, so I, I did this in Belgium. I did that in Netherlands, in in Luxembourg, and in France for sites uh, that uh, because that was all new for us. So basically, now as a project manager, uh, and and that's what I'm telling to my project managers, you know. When you are going to those exotic countries, that's exactly the same as when I was uh, going to my uh, Belgian sites back in '98. Unbelievable! What a great anecdote. I didn't realize that. It seems to me I'm hearing three or four major themes in this discussion today. And what is that country and region are what I call a main effect? It, no matter how we run the study, there's going to be an influence on the patient based upon where they're located and the site. Of course, it's managing the patient. I hear an old school, a resurrection of an old school physician to physician contact that's needed here. I also hear, Terry, you're basically borrowing experiences from cardiology and applying it to immunology, kind of borrowing from Peter to pay Paul. And I also heard very strongly listening to you the need to have protocols that are consistent with the, stand, the local standards of care. It's embedding the protocol in a standard of care. Now, I also heard quite a bit about physician oversight and coverage and innovative strategies. And I'm wondering, Jim, I'm looking forward to the next idea here about innovative trial designs. I recently have heard quite a bit about the use of basket strategies and other types of innovative trial design, it, you know, indications in immunology that we've never traditionally had that consideration. Obviously in oncology that's a that's a different story. So let me just ask you, Jim, so, so what is this basket design exactly? What are the innovative designs that are rippling into immunology lately? How do you see that evolving? Well, uh, Mike, this is a great question. Actually, the basket design is not a new design. It's been always used in oncology, as we know that, you know, there are, uh, the oncology, it's a spreading disease that you can very much have multiple targets from the same condition. Uh, so that's now used in immunology because of the similarity now that you have some molecular marker, markers for multiple diseases are very much the same. So that came the idea that using the basket strategy also the same way. So we have now a lot of biologics that's been actually by using the basket strategy been very proven to be very effective. For example, you know, we have infliximab. Now we have multiple uh, uh, IMEDS condition like uh, RA and uh, Crohn's disease, ulcerative colitis and psoriatic arthritis, you know, they've been, you know, very much have the same type of molecular markers that by using the basket strategy can address these conditions with one targeted therapeutics that can give you a lot of advantage for the design of the trial. For example, that you can have, you know, like a small number of patients and then you can achieve the efficacy. It's right on target. Um, and of course, so that would be more dependent on you know the success of these type trials. Always dependent on how strong is 
the connection or the, 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 the linkage between the target and the targeted therapy. So that's very important to establish in the beginning. And then, you know, for the advantage also that we'll be able to come up to identifying new targets, uh, being able to stress and to confirm the validation of these targets, um, you know, and then would lead us to the proof of principle for what we're doing. Uh, and, you know, you can use multiple baskets actually for, you know, several conditions that you would be able to think or to come to the, the, the conclusion that they may share very much the same molecular markers so that leads us to, you know, at the end of the day to, you know, what's called the precision medicine nowadays. And it's very effective because we're able to very much come to a, um, a maybe possibly a complete remission for the disease versus the old way of symptomatic treatments. So definitely basket strategy is the way to go for the future. Yeah, but I wonder, Jim, do, do you really find it to be useful or, or instead does it simply introduce a complexity into everything that all of us need to do, particularly the execution of the study, which actually negates the scientific interest in the concept? How do you see that one? Well, I mean, it's, it's, you know, it's, it's important nowadays because we have to consider many factors in the development program. We consider the cost, we consider the objectives of the sponsor, and also addressing the portfolio. We try to get, you know, many possible indications, you know, for, for, for our sponsors. So we have to consider that factor. However, there are some disadvantages, like I mentioned, you know, like if some of the, if the patients sometimes that they would be non-responsive because maybe they have a secondary mutation or so in their immune system that can possibly, you know, affect the, the outcome of the trial. So there are pros and cons. And that's why we work with our sponsors on what would fit their program most likely. So it would not completely negate still the old way of doing development, uh, you know, because we're still early on in that field and we're doing a lot of research until we come to a point that we are confident that, you know, to, to, to be able to establish that strong link between the target and the targeted therapy uh, and when we come to that point, then we'll be able to know for sure that, you know, this would be the way to go. Seems to me I've heard about three or four different points here, Jim. And this but first is there has to be a toolbox of design options. We can't go in there and assume that everything is a placebo control parallel group investigation. Secondly, we have to accommodate the incredibly rapidly emerging science, and we have to acknowledge the current R&D business needs, I think, moving forward. As we look at the old program today, let's kind of revisit all the major points that we've just attempted to, to ex examine. First, I have to ask the question, is everything immunology? There was a recent uh, editorial in last week's New England Journal that brought up the issues in cardiology. It seems to me it's back to school for those of us that did not come up in that discipline. There's a need for hiring and training a whole new era of monitors and medical staff in this particular area of research particularly. I loved Ingrid's approach of winning on the first step. If you don't win it right out of the box, you're not going to meet the timelines and the deliverables to which you've had an agreement. Rolana, the focus is on the patient. It's always on the patient and increasingly so in immune-mediated disorders. The selection of measures, how we roll that out, train staff, and manage that is key. And as Atari has just so brilliantly showed us, geography matters. Where we do the study, how the design looks, how we implement it is an overwhelming factor. So as we move ahead now, there's usually a few minutes left when we do these things for getting some really neat questions. And so let's take a look at whether or not some of the folks in the audience have had some questions for us. There's always a few. Here's the first one, Jim, this one that just came in. So how do you handle the risk issues involved in the nature of IMID indications? How, how do you do that? Well, uh, you know, that's actually an excellent question, Mike. And, uh, you know, there are issues related to IMID. I mean, we know it's the way of the future, you know, for reaching uh, uh, some type of remission for these diseases, but there are other issues related to that. For example, TB, 
tuberculosis, you know, is a major aspect of it, and we always make sure in our trials that that's been, we have regular tests for that and in, in the visits in order to evaluate that. Infection is another aspect, and, you know, we also have the, we'll make sure that we have the labs, you know, done regularly in all the visits. Uh, the infusion for some of these biologics, there's a lot, you know, reaction to that. There is the injection site reaction, that's an issue that's involved. And, you know, at the end of the day, also, we have, it's, it's being proven, you know, uh, uh, from clinically that combining two biologics, it's very serious, can lead to very serious infection. So we ensure our patients not exposed to other biologics when we do our uh, trials. Um, and then also the sites for the IMEDs, it's very important to have the experience with these conditions, to have the right patients, to have the experience with the scales that's being used to that, because these scales actually at the end of the day, depending on the PI and the, how they look at the improvement of the patient. So it's very important to make sure that these PIs are trained on these scales, for example, the POSI scales and many of our you know trials, we have to make sure that they are very well trained on that. And also for rare diseases that we handle very well on many of our trials, we make sure that many of these PIs, because it's a rare disease, it's very hard to find the patients, very hard to diagnose them. For example, Meniere's disease, the other trial that we were working on the other day, we have to make sure that we have KOLs in that trials because most of these sites will be academic sites. And that's very important for a rare disease. It's always considered a KOL, a person who's expert in the area can identify the patients and diagnose them. Uh, so all these aspects and risks involved in this area, you know, now we have to watch for it and make sure it's all covered in order to achieve the outcome, successful outcome for our trials. Uh, here's another one, uh, Ingrid, I think this is probably for you, and it's, it's the old recurrent theme that we always hear about. How do you make a study successful, manage the timelines, and I call it, you know, I'm going to translate here slightly from this question, adjudicate the interest of the sponsor against the realities of a clinical study. Well, that's the whole point of uh, project management. That's really, uh, you know, the success of the trial really lies on the success of the team. If you are able to really have uh, the adequate team, um, and that's, for me, it's, it's really the, 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 the key, is to find really the people that will have the adequate experience uh, to have the the, the, the real experts uh, and and the experts that are, that have that expertise in that particular uh, therapeutic area that's really very important because even for regulatory submissions for example um, you know you can you can screw up completely if you did not uh, have um, foreseen I would say the potential questions that might come up with the specificities of uh, the trial, the, the disease you are you are uh, you are working in. So you know we we very often think oh well a regulatory does not need to be uh, therapeutically aligned. I'm not I'm not in agreement with that because the questions you receive from the ethics committee or from the uh, from the competent authorities, they are very often uh, linked to uh, the therapeutic area. So making sure you have the right people, that is really the key. Um, and then in that team, creating that can-do attitude and that out-of-the-box thinking that is, uh, that is essential. That is also uh, the basis of a, a good relationship with the sponsor, because we are all with the same objective, making that trial um, a success. We do that because we want to have, uh, you know, a sponsor feeling that we are part of that success. Um, so really taking the same objective, aligning the objective of our t operational team with the objective of the sponsor, that is, that is um, also one of the key of the success. Fantastic insights. Well, we run out of time, everyone, and as we mentioned at the beginning of our presentation, our purpose was to illustrate some content issues, and my goodness, there's a wealth of information in this last hour. But more importantly, we wanted to illustrate a method of doing business, a way of approaching a problem. And if we could, Liz, kind of talk about one of the offerings that WCT now has on the tray. Thanks, Dr. Murphy, and, and thank you for everyone for taking the time to connect with our worldwide experts. We were inspired by the discussion and today, and we hope that you were too. We'd like you to contact us to continue the conversation. 
As I mentioned earlier, this webinar has been recorded and all attendees will receive a link to the on-demand recording. For more information about Worldwide, we, we invite you to visit worldwide.com. We hope you have enjoyed today's webinar and we hope you have a wonderful day.